based on some of the core values we have here at the church. We're not talking about all of our core values, but we are going through a brief series on what makes us tick, what is the underlying foundation of how we do things, and, and why we do things. And so, if you're taking notes, you're looking for a sermon title, write down this, Spiritual Contributors. Spiritual Contributors. And if you don't like that title, go ahead and make another one up. <laughs> but primarily we'll be using a lot of Bible verses today and a lot of note-taking. So I'm going to make it real simple and say, write this down. And then <laughs> I'm going to say, you're not going to have time to flip through the Bible verses because I'm going to be moving quickly. There's a lot to cover. So just write down where it's found. I'll give you the verse. Let's start with John chapter 4. Are we ready? Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Now, these are the gifts, of, gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then, we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. These are two verses that are typically not on a Christian's favorite Bible verses that they apply to their lives. Everybody's got a special verse. I like this verse. I like that verse. We're more than conquerors. They have those, I will never leave you, forsake you. They love to have light verses. Pastors love these two verses because it shows really two things. The first part of it shows that really uh, doing the work of God and growing in Christ and being fed spiritually is less about downloading and more about doing. And the next verse that I read really kind of throws in, it shows how God puts together different leadership structures in order to equip you to be able to do the work of the ministry. That means that it's not left to precious few. It's actually left up to the body to do the work. Amen. So our assignment is to teach you how to do the work of the kingdom. Amen. So what these two verses really mean is, one, feeding has nothing to do with what I'm teaching you. And two, my job is to teach you how to do the work yourself. The problem with a lot of American churches today, and we're across America, we're full of church buildings that uh, people want to come in, they want to get their free donut, they want to drop their kids off, and then they want to have a message that they like in a way that they like it and use it the way they want it, and then they go home and their life is really not changed. They have a few sermons where I call it one, two, three, apply it to me, and if I can't apply it to my life, then I'm going to check out. The problem with that is that's more of a consumer Christianity, and that's not the way that God designed it. Amen. You'd be shocked at the excuses that we hear all the time about how why people leave churches. Let me give you a couple, and they have nothing to do with this church. So I'm not giving you anything that I hear here, and I'm not referring to anything here, but just some of my friends and what they've dealt with. I once know a church where people were leaving their church because they did not serve donuts on Sunday morning. I kid you not they did not serve donuts on Sunday morning I don't know if they served the God of Glaze I don't know and I know another church 
where they were saying that they had people come to their church because they did have coffee before the service. So they left their previous church. They, had, they didn't care about what they were being taught or where they were going. They loved the coffee. It was the grind that brought them. Right? So I don't know, maybe is that Jehovah Java? I don't know. Is that a new name of God? Here's another friend of mine. True story. A, a friend of mine, Pastor Shannon and I, uh, he was morbidly obese. He could not make it up the stairs of his church to his own office. So he went on a TV show called The Biggest Loser. Okay? He was on that TV show where the church's blessing, everything was fine. When he came back, having radically transformed his life, people left his church. Why? Because he wasn't fat anymore. <laughs> and they actually said, Pastor, we're glad you changed your life, but you make us feel bad. He said, you're leaving our church because I'm not fat anymore? And they said, yes. <laughs> See, what happens is, a lot of people go to church and they go around because they want their way. I want the music my way. I want the preaching my way. I want you to preach it my way. And if it's my will be done, it'll never be thy will be done. Come on. Now, I'm not talking about styles. Come on. Styles are different. And styles have to adjust based on the culture that you're in. Culture, we, we, we minister in, in Las Vegas. That culture is a whole lot different than what you see down here. Pastor Tom can tell you that. It is a different animal. Will people throw poker chips into the, into the offering? Yep. It's a different game. Okay? And I tell you, real quick, you've got to get over how people are dressed. Because they would come in in their card dealing uniforms. Okay? A lot different from our ministry in the Pacific Northwest, where everybody's subdued and depressed, listening to their grunge and Nirvana stuff. A lot different from Orange County. When we came to, to, to Riverside, Pastor Shannon and I had to adjust our style because the culture was different. So I'm not talking about style. I'm more talking about an attitude. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. So the question that I have for you um, is, are you going to be the kind of Christian that wants to come in and grab your donuts and grab your coffee and then empty your pockets of leftover change and, and, and expect me to just to bless you? Or... Do you actually want to be something bigger in the body of Christ? Do you want to be a consumer or do you want to be a contributor? I can tell you this, that the church does not exist for us. We are the church of Jesus Christ and we exist for the world. God calls us as his body to make an impact in our communities, to make an impact in the world. And we've got to do it together, but we've got to get over what we call the disease of me. You were planned for God's pleasure. You were formed for God's family. You were created to become like Christ. You were shaped for service and made for a mission. Therefore, we must be participators and not spectators. Amen. Therefore, we are called to be saints, not ain'ts. <laughs> I like that one. We're contributors, not consumers. If you miss these things, then you'll completely miss your mission and you'll come to the end of your life wondering what could have been. So in the next few moments, I want to talk about these just a little bit. Because we are called as the church of Jesus Christ to do more than just to come in once a week, sit here, and go home. We are actually called to fulfill our part of the Great Commission. And that's what we're here to help you to do. So write this down. I am planned for God's pleasure. Or I was planned for God's pleasure. The book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11, says this. You, meaning God, created everything, and it is for your pleasure that they exist and were created. Psalm 149, verse 4 says, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Did you know that God loves you? See, a lot of people go through their whole life never hearing the simple fact that God loves you. We hear that God's mad at you a lot. We hear that God's going to judge you a lot or God's going to get you. But God loves you. He is crazy about you. And he actually planned you to love you. That's why the most important thing that you can have here in this life is a good relationship with the Father. Hosea 6, 6 says, I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. 
If I were to ask you what two of the most important words of Christianity would be, some of you would say religious devotion, or you might say ethical behavior, moral obedience. But what God is looking for with his people is a love affair. And even more important, God is looking for one word, which is intimacy. Now, I don't want to cheapen the word intimacy based on the world standards. Because the world would have you to believe that intimacy has to do with physical touch. But that has nothing to do with it. Intimacy, properly written down, is in to me see. Intimacy is knowing somebody on such a level that nobody else knows him. Just like you. God wants us to have that kind of an intimate relationship with him. Where we understand his heart. We understand why he wants us to move a certain way. And in turn, we get so close to him that we're just, we're just around him. It works. Does that make sense? Yeah. We need to be so close to God that we don't have to tell people that we're Christians. Like the video. He's trying to read his Bible, and the person next to him says, are you a believer? And he's shocked, saying, isn't it obvious? People should know there's something different about you. This week, I had to return one of my gifts that I messed up for Pastor Shannon. And while we're there at the store trying to get this thing exchanged, the person at the counter says, man, name is Quincy. I like you, Kobe. You know, What's your real name, though? He didn't believe my name was Kobe Bryant. He said, he said, I like you. You just got a good vibe about you. I just want to be around you. Come on. That was nothing but the Holy Spirit. That's all it was. People may not know what it is. And don't be offended if they can't tell. Because they'll usually filter it through what their experience is. Come on, if they're Buddhist, they may think that you've got good karma. Right. Mm-hmm. Don't be mad at them because they're sensing the Holy Spirit. The anointing either attracts people to you or repels them from you. Yeah. Okay? So when the Holy Spirit's drawing them to you, just go with it. It's okay to explain it. Just go with it. But you should be so close to God that when you walk by, they know something is different about you. God is pleased when we love him above everything else. Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. If we don't fall in love with Jesus then we will tragically have a failure of a life. And as a believer, it does not work. The next thing I want you to understand is you were formed for God's family. So write this down. I was formed for God's family. God wanted a family and he made you. That may sound strange to some of you, but Ephesians 1.5 says, His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family By bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. We're not called just to believe. We're also called to belong. There's a lot of believers, but what we need is a lot of belongers. And what I mean by that is we need to belong to a specific church family. Amen. There's a lot of weird things happening in the church today. I don't get it. We have a lot of floaters in the body of Christ. People who float from this church to this church to this ministry. I call them floaters. And the hard part about it is when you are floating in Christianity and you never settle down in a church home, you're going to miss the fullness that God has for you. Amen. Okay? Because God has created everybody as a body. That's why you're not a bad person if you go and you want to go hear this speaker or you want to. I'm not saying that. But because there are so many uh, books you can read. And podcasts you can download. And sermons you can watch online or hit on YouTube. A lot of people feel they don't need to have a church family. And that's not the truth. You actually need somebody in your life that is to lead you and to guide you and to help you down that path. That's why we already read how God himself has established apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers. To be able to equip you, to help you. And there's no way you can be equipped for ministry on YouTube. It just can't happen. Families stick together. Families work together. That's why I was very proud of our church and how we responded this week, showing the Shelley family how much we love them. And we love you guys. That's what families do. We come together and help each other out when tragedy strikes. 
But there's a lot of Christians who bounce around from place to place and they never get plugged in. A Christian without a church home is nothing more than an orphan. It's like a football player without a team, a soldier without a platoon, a tuba player without an orchestra, or a bee without a hive. It does not work. Amen. We need to be all in to one church family, and I'll explain to you why. When you start going and bouncing around other churches, here's a little secret. Most pastors, good pastors, don't just show up on Saturday night going, shoot, it's 10, what am I preaching tomorrow? We have a plan. We have a plan that fits the overall vision that God has given us for a body. So we create step-by-step -step processes that move people along a path, it's movement, so that they're just not hearing sermons from week to week. There's a method to their madness. We teach you our way of doing things. We teach you the way of thinking in order to fulfill the vision that God has for this house, for that house. So when you're getting fed by other ministries all the time, and you're never loyal to one, you're almost, I want to say you have multiple personalities based on what you're trying to be spiritually. Because you've got this pastor's method of studying Bible, which doesn't fit with this pastor's method. Some people go and we're worried about missionaries, and then you don't submit to pastoral authority. Or you go from prophet to prophet to prophet, and then to evangelists, but their gifting is not equipping and teaching. So you've got to have that balance, and that's what the church family brings. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we bounce around, we're being taught everybody else's methods, but never the one that God has for here. Easy way to understand it, military. Any military people in the house? Military. Okay. Does not do very much good to have a Navy base in New Mexico. <laughs> Purpose isn't for that. Nor do you put a secret base in the middle of L.A. You put it out in Area 51. Right? Everybody knows it's there. I grew up watching all those crazy things because I was out in the desert. Why? Because it best fits there. I believe churches are like those little bases. Each one of them is designed with intent, with a specific skill set in order to do a specific thing. Therefore, as you come to a family together, we have to figure out what that part plays in the overall whole as God has led that specific ministry. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we don't want to go around at different places, but we also don't want to neglect church either. I've heard a lot of people say, you know what, I believe in God, I just don't believe in His church. Fair statement. There's a lot of Christians that if that's the way God really was, I wouldn't want to be one either. Come on, has anybody ever had that experience before? But since Jesus calls the church the body of Christ, it'd be like me saying, you know, I like you, I just don't like your body. <laughs> well, that's insulting, isn't it? Or how about this one? The church is also referred to the bride of Christ. Hey, I love you, but I hate your wife. That would not go over very well with me. So when we don't want to get involved in church, and we don't want to make a church home, that's exactly the same thing that we're telling Jesus. It may not seem like it, but that's really what it is. 58 times in the New Testament, the Bible talks about having one another. Love for one another, caring for one another, praying for one another. That's what real fellowship is. The next thing I want to tell you is you were created to become like Christ. Say, I was created to be like Christ. Write that down. Write that down. Romans 8.29 For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. God has always had that plan of making you into the image of his Son. Not to become a God, but so that you become godly. There's a big, big difference. What am I saying? God is more worried about what you are than what you do. See, a lot of people come to me and say, Pastor, I don't know what to do with my life. If you can work on your character, your career will follow. Now, we know faith without works is dead and useless. It doesn't work. But when you're trying to figure out how to get back with God, focus on you at being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Because your being is what impacts your doing. Amen. That's why I know people who are close to God, people who are really close to God, 
never talk about not being fed in church. Because they're always doing the work of the ministry. People who are close to God usually don't have time to gossip because they're too worried about hearing from God than to talk about somebody else. Okay? You've got to have that mentality where I'm going to become like Christ. That's why we put on the mindset of Christ. Mm -hmm. Philippians 2.5 says, In your lives, you must think and act like Jesus. So when we're trying to figure out how I want to behave in a certain situation, or how I might move forward in a situation, you really do need to ask yourself, not just what would Jesus do, but what did Jesus do? <laughs> For a long time since we've seen those t-shirts and those bumper stickers, and I don't think the church really got it. What did Jesus do? He knew how to confront sin with love. He knew how to go out and seek and save that which is lost. He came here to redeem mankind. He came to do what the Father said to do. To say what the Father said today. He came to reestablish what was lost in the original sin in the garden. Ultimately, he came to destroy the works of the devil. That's 1 John 3, 8. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. If we're really going to become like Christ, then we need to hate what the devil has done in our lives. Amen. Hate what the devil is doing to our society. Hate what he's done to our family. Sickness is not from God. If you believe God made you sick, then don't pray about it because you'll be out of God's will. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Poverty, lack, it is not God's will. Now, we have to experience it. We go through it. But we need to understand the thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. But God came that you may have life. So when Jesus comes into this world, he had that one mission, destroy the works of the devil. And since we are to become like Christ, that also needs to become what we do and how we move forward. Awfully quiet in here, but I'm going to keep going. We need to have a mindset of Jesus, which is an attitude of the impossible. It's been said that it is abnormal for a Christian um, to not have an appetite for the impossible. It has been written into our spiritual DNA to hunger for the impossibilities around us, to bow at the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you this. When Jesus becomes alive in you and you begin to think like him, then you'll stop limiting yourself to man-made rules and limitations. Jesus knew how to walk on water. He had a funny way of doing what said could not be done. Jesus knew how to defy logic of man and actually do what God wanted him to do. And as a result, he knew how to heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. People would touch him and be healed. What's freaky for some people is Jesus said, everything that I taught you, everything that I demonstrated, now you go do. We don't like that. Because we like the information, but we don't like the demonstration. But if we really want to be like Christ, at some level, we must walk in the supernatural. I'm not talking about the spooky, freaky, weird people who, who, who make a mockery of it. But the reality is, the super is, a, is more real than the natural. And when you allow the Holy Spirit of God to move in your life, He will show you things that you never saw before. He will teach you things that you never learned before. He is the one who will lead you and guide you and empower you. And you will not be able to help but walk in the stores and have people say, I don't know what's about you, but you just got some good vibes. That's nothing but the Holy Ghost. So the question is, do you want to be like Christ, or do you want to be like that TV preacher? Come on. It's the truth. A lot of us are disciples. We're just not disciples of Jesus. Right? So we've got to come in on this and become more like Jesus. Now, was there any time Jesus was lonely? Yes. Was he ever tempted? Yes. Did he ever have to go through trials? Yes. Was he misunderstood? Yes. Did he have family issues? Yes. Was he criticized? Yes. So don't buy into the lie that once you come to Jesus, you'll, your kids will always obey you, you'll never hit a red light, and you'll never have to worry about a parking spot for Christmas. I mean, that's a lie. If God didn't save his own son from that, he's not going to save you. You're going to experience a lot of what Jesus experienced because we're becoming like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Jesus never said you wouldn't go through tough times. He just promised you'd never go through it alone. 
You were shaped for service. Write that down. I was shaped for service. Amen. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's Ephesians 2.10. Another name for good works is ministry. All right? Here at Mission Church, we believe that every member is a minister, and every ministry is important. Every person is a minister. Everybody. Everything is critical to the overall scope of things. Now, is everybody a pastor? No. Is everybody an apostle? No. Is everybody an evangelist? No. But we're all needed. I had a friend of mine bought me a shirt, and I have it on today. And we have a picture of it in the back. Let's show what it says. And I want to show it now because this is fun. I had to wear it. Pastor is my title because hardcore devil-stopping ninja isn't an official job title. <laughs> I'm a pastor. That's what I do. That's, that's that basically, in a nutshell, is what I am, a hardcore devil-stopping ninja. That's what I do. It's me. I don't sing. I sound like I'm strangling a cat. It doesn't work. So I stay to my lane. I know what I'm good at, and I know what I'm not good at, and I'll tell you, the greatest, most liberating day in my life is when I realized that I was not good at everything. Uh, uh, come on. That I have a gift from God, and there are some things where I am somebody else's tormentor. I mean, I tell you, I know what I'm good at and what I'm not. And as a minister, that's a good place to be, because I only want to do my assignment, I don't want to have to do yours. And I learned I don't have to be good at everything. If I can build a team around me, that I can fill the need that they don't have. They can fill the need that I don't have. And together we can do some amazing things. If two agree on everything, then one of them's not needed. That's why God often puts opposites together in a marriage. It is the truth. You can walk in agreement, not always agree on everything, but you are shaped for a service. And if you're writing notes down, write shape, and we're going to give you an acronym. The first thing of what makes you you and how God formed you and all that is that he gives you spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11 says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit that is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. It is God who does the work in us. Got that? A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the, uh, the ability to give a wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a special message of knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of knowledge. To one, he gives the Spirit of, of healing, power to perform miracles, one's the prophetic, it goes on and on. In a nutshell, the spiritual gifts are the words of wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, the prophetic, the distinguishing of the spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Okay? Those are the gifts that we give. It's all included in there. I want to cut it. We're running out of time. That is what God gives you. God gives you that. Okay? You didn't earn it. Those are things that just happen to you. And the Holy Spirit comes alive in you. So you can't take credit for it either. Right. Not one gift is better than the other one. In fact, if we had to put things into an issue, Paul tells us, look, I'd rather y'all prophesy. Mm -hmm. But sometimes in churches, especially denominational Pentecostal churches, typically we highlight one over another. We highlight tongues over anything else. And that person has a free will to interrupt services whenever they feel like it. We don't do that here, but I grew up that way. And we make it really more of a mockery of anything else because the gifts are demonstrated in order. Amen. Okay? Amen. But we at this church believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to equip us and give us these gifts. Another thing he gives us is our heart. What are you passionate about? That's a gift from God. Listen, there are passions that you have that I do not have. Some people say, Pastor, you need to be involved in social injustice. No, you need to be involved in social injustice. That's not my heart. Doesn't mean it's, it's a bad thing. It's just not how God made me. How about your abilities? What are you able to do? These are the natural abilities you have. Do you understand music? Do you understand numbers, organization, business? 
Those are things that you have that help for the work of the ministry. How about your personality, P? This was given you by God for a specific reason. Now, this is where we've got to have some, some help here. Between your abilities and your personality. Like I said before, if you sound like you're strangling a cat, you should not be worshipped. <laughs> not a good thing. Okay? And that happens all the time. And, you, and, and you, I know the Bible says make a joyful noise. That, you know, I make a joyful noise in and out when I get, you know, a nice 4 by 4 I mean, it sounds more like smacking, but it doesn't work that way. You'd be surprised how you get offended. And nobody, it's, it's like American Idol. Everybody's told them they can sing until they get live on TV and they really can't. If you don't know how to smile, you cannot be a greeter. Okay? If you have been in prison for theft, you cannot count offering. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, I'm kind of saying that tongue-in-cheek, but you'd be surprised at how many people come in and have bizarre ideas. Okay? What is God giving you the ability to do? Then we're going to help with that. Outside, we're actually trying to help a lot of people come involved in ministry. We need people to help with our children. We need people at the information booth. We need more ushers. We need more of a stage crew. We need people who will host small groups. We need people who will lead small groups. We're trying to get our youth program up and rocking. We have a lot of opportunities for you to come a part of what we're doing. And we're actually calling you the dream team. Okay? For you to be able to do the work of the ministry. But it only does, it only works if you get involved. So there's signups that are going to be for the next few weeks out in the information table for you to put down what you'd like to do and then see what goes from there. Does that make sense? Yes. We want you to be involved, but everybody's going to be different. So, make a difference in the world. Don't just take up resources. And the last thing I want to say this is, I was made for a mission. Write that down. I was made for a mission. If you want God's blessing in your life, then you must care about what God cares about. And God cares about bringing lost people into his family. We call this evangelism. If we don't care about getting people saved, then we are not the church that Jesus Christ set up. Amen. It was very, very clear. It was a major part of his life. For a church to say that we don't care about bringing lost people in and getting them saved and changing them, then we're basically saying, we're saved, we're going to heaven, but the rest of the world can go to hell. If I had the cure for cancer and I didn't share it, I would be evil. If I had a cure for AIDS and didn't share it, I would be evil. If I saw you playing on a train track and I saw a train coming, I would start yelling at you. Get off the track. And if I'm yelling at you, I would get more violent about it. Get off the track now. And there will be a point where I will physically go run and tackle you off the track to save you from dying. Are you with me? We have people who are about to go to hell and we can care less. Don't raise your hands. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But here's the deal. In the next 365 days, 231,000 Californians will die. 2.3 Americans, 54 million in the world. Is anybody going to go to heaven because of you? I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. We're going to talk about evangelism in a couple weeks. I'm not going to go into too much detail. But I can tell you this. Does God care for the lost? Absolutely. Amen. How much? I don't know. He cared enough to die. God cared enough to turn his back away from his son. It was so shattering. The sun hit his face. The ground began to shake. They couldn't figure out what was happening. Why? Because God loves the lost, the lost so much. And while the world, the church is saying, I hate the world, I hate the world, I hate the world. God said, for God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for it. My goodness. If we don't love the lost, you're not a Christian. Hey, I, I love you, but i got to be straight with it. And I'll tell you this. As the musicians come back. We need to minister to them in a way that makes sense to them. Okay? You know me by now, it's been three years. It's been three years. I don't think I've ever watered down a sermon in my life. And I never will. But the most important tool of evangelism 
It's not sending your money overseas. See, a lot of people think I'm getting people saved because I'm sending my money overseas. So you go to bed at night thinking I'm okay now. Because I've passed off the information to somebody else. And your neighbor's dying and going to hell. Your family members in your own home living in sin, you don't want to confront because what if they leave? What if they die and go to hell? Hell is a long time to be away from God. It's forever. All that we're doing is to complete the mission that God has assigned us to do. We've got to care. We don't pass our offerings off to somebody else to do it for us. We take responsibility for it. Because God cares about it. I tell you the greatest, effective, most effective tool is just getting people into the presence of God. It's not a program, it's not a tract. It really isn't. Even though we're doing the football video, that's not the most effective way of getting somebody saved. The most effective way is to get them into the presence of God. How do you do that? The Bible says the kingdom of God is in you. How do I get people in the presence of God? I don't know. Go to a movie. You've got 150 people trapped in the presence of God. Seriously? Seriously? I had stories. I told you. Pastor Shannon, not the, not the mall. They were coming up to try to witness to her. She ends up witnessing to them. That's a divine appointment. I'm telling you, when you want close to God, you don't have to try to set up the situation. God is bringing them to you. Amen. But God won't send them if you condemn them. Now, the Bible does say that we're supposed to go. Go. Go, go, go. But what's weird is there's something amazing about the presence of God that's also attractive. So as you're going, they're running to you. It's a weird, bizarre game. But can I tell you this? Acts 13, 36 says that David served God's purposes in his own generation, and then he died. I would love for that to be said about me. That Kobe Bryant served his purpose for his generation, and then he died. What would they say about you? Jesus said, I brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Let's not be distracted from our mission. Let's not allow other people, plans, programs, problems, and pressures. Take us away from our purpose, and that is to fulfill the Great Commission. For Luke 9, 62 says, Anyone who lets himself be distracted from the work I plan for him is not fit for the kingdom of God. Listen, Pastor Kobe didn't say that. Jesus did. I see a church where people give more than they receive. Where people serve more than they've been served. Where people love more than they've been loved. Where people are passionate about reaching our next generation. Where they don't judge those without Christ, but we love them into the family of God. Where everyone uses their gifts in the church to equip the body of Christ. And where we use our gifts in this church to be the light of the world. Let's stand on our feet. Friends, it is absolutely critical not just be hearers of the word, but we become doers of the word. Is it going to stretch us? Absolutely. Are we going to be rejected? Yep. But there's no greater life than one serving Jesus. Not everybody's got it all figured out. Trust me. I'll be the first one to say of these things I just gave you. I struggle with some. We just struggle with all of them. And I say that because I want you to know it's okay. Just walk in Christ. It's a process. It's a walk. There's going to be some weeks that you are messed up and you fail. It's okay. Get back up and keep trying. A wise man once said, it's not about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. 
name is Rocky. It's great. Keep moving forward. We have a mission. I'm actually going to close with prayer. So I want you to think about what I've said. I want you to think about where you can get involved. I want you to think about that person who's never heard about Jesus and they're waiting on you. God is counting on you to change eternity. Think about that person. Ask God for strength. Ask God for boldness. You don't know how much time you have. You really, really don't. You don't. You never know when it's your moment. I don't want to miss anything God has for me. Let's close your eyes and let's pray. Father, more than anything else, we want to fulfill our mission that you created us for. Lord, I want you to use me anytime, any way, in any place. We want our lives, Lord, to bring you pleasure. We want our hearts to love you and worship you. And we want to be used to build a fellowship between believers rather than tearing it down. We thank you, Lord, that we are part of your family. Lord, we want to fulfill our mission and bring others to you. Give us a burden for those who are around us who don't know you. Let us serve our purpose for this generation. We want to be a part of what you're doing. Lord, help our church fulfill its mission. Use us to change eternity. Amen. Show us what you have for us, how we're shaped, how we can be used by you. And Lord, I ask specifically that every person in this room would have the joy this year of being able to say that they changed eternity for somebody. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, think this week how you can get involved. Think this week, who needs to hear about the loving Jesus Christ, the life-changing power of the gospel? And don't wait for somebody else to do it for you. You do it. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. You're dismissed. I'll see you.